six there. All right. Uh, now just to kind of remind us of where we are. Remember the New Jerusalem has come down. Uh, the many commentators, many different pastors, preachers think two different things. I'm not going to argue either way because the Bible doesn't make it clear. It could be uh, 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 kind of in the air like the, the moon is now uh, in space or just outside the earth. Or it could be that the New Jerusalem comes to the earth and is on the earth itself uh, and, and lands down. Uh, then we see right there verse 1, a river of, of water of life. There's crystal proceeding out of the throne of God, of the Lamb. Uh, in the midst of the street uh, of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life. You all remember the tree of life that um, Adam and Eve were not allowed to eat after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says right there that um, that the the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And I got I, uh, I think it was Donna was talking about last week. She said that you know how about these people that came through into the millennial. Uh, into the millennial reign uh, that were still flesh and blood. And I got to researching some of this and a lot of people believe what you just said. That they're going to get their their new bodies and these bodies are going to be perfect. They're not going to be uh, uh, touched by sin but they could still be flesh and blood. Which means that if I fall I could break my leg, I could break, you know, I could cut myself, or it could just be that it's the representation of these leaves uh, uh, of the healing of the nations. Uh, the representation of uh, this tree of life. Uh, what, is, what does fruit do for you uh, when you eat it? It sustains you, right? So we're going to be eating of the different fruits of these trees, of this tree of life, and these leaves are going to be the healing of the nations. Well, it could be that these nations, these kings, as they come to give the sacrifices unto Jesus, that the, these uh, the, it, it's just a representation. As they come in, they, they see this tree of life. They eat of the fruits. And, and these leaves that are evergreen, that are always always budding and always green and always full of fruit. Always, What does it represent in the Bible when, when, when the Bible talks about uh, the yielding of the fruit or the, 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 the fruitfulness? What, what, is, what does that represent in the Bible? Do you all know? Like joy and peace. Yes. Okay. The, uh, blessings from God. Uh, the blood, that, when you think of the, the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, love, uh, uh, long-suffering, but the, the God promised Israel that they would be fruitful, that, that they, if they were obedient, that they, uh, that they would be, have an abundance in, uh, in their gardening, in, the, in their lives. Well, that's what this tree of life is. It's a proof and a promise from God that, you, that there will always be fruit there. Now, this new Jerusalem is going to be where Jesus is. And it says there will be no temple there. Why is there no temple in, in, in the New Jerusalem? There's no temple in the New Jerusalem because where Jesus is is where we will worship. And Jesus is there in the New Jerusalem. There's not going to be one specific place that where He's going to be. He's going to be all over. And you might meet Him on the street. That's where you worship Him. Why do we come to church? We talked about this Sunday. We come to church to worship God. We come to church to learn about God. We come to church to grow. Well, people of the nations of the, of the earth are going to be coming to Jesus. Uh, uh, they'll come once a year. They'll come ten times a year. They'll come a thousand times a year. I don't know. But they're going to come to, and they're going to come to worship Jesus. They're going to come to talk to Jesus. They're going to, become, they're going to come to, to just be in His awe. And, and, and this, this everybody fruit is going to be a promise from God that you come to Jesus and you're going to receive blessings. You come to Jesus and worship Him, you're going to have everlasting life because of Jesus, okay? There should be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and His servants shall serve Him. The servants, who are these servants going to be? Who's going to serve Jesus? It's going to be the church. 
It's going to be the church. Uh, the church are going to be the ones that are going to be servants. Uh, we're going to serve Jesus. And it's not going to be like a slavery type service. It's not going to be like, you know, your mom and dad tell you, uh, get out there and mow the yard, like we were just talking about. Get out there and weed it. It's not going to be that, that type of service. It's going to be like, mom, dad, can I go mow weed it? I want to mow weed it, right? It's like, yeah, I know, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to want to. We as a church are going to desire to serve Jesus in every possible way. How are we going to serve Jesus? Well, we're not really sure. Uh, are we going to uh, take fruit from the New Jerusalem, from the Tree of Life, to the different nations on the earth, uh, all across the earth? Could be. Are we going to be the ones that are going to bring word uh, uh, for those that maybe not have made it to Jerusalem in the past six months that Jesus is the light of the world still, and he's still on the throne, and, and, and we've had this happen and this happen, and praise reports, and there's going to be hours and hours of praise reports. That could be. We don't know exactly sure what it's going to be, how it's going to be. I heard one pastor today, uh, I found a, a, another podcast, uh, Calvary Chapel pastor, say he believes that God is, I believe, God is the God of the universe. He created the universe. So how much many more earths are there out there? Could it be that we will be representing Jesus that will be in Jerusalem to all these other earths? Could be. And you're thinking, Darren, wow, what, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I don't know. We don't know exactly what this is going to be. But we're going to desire to serve God. Okay, Verse 4, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. What is the name? that will be in the foreheads of those that see his face that serve him. Jesus. Jesus. That will be his name. That is the name that we will have in our foreheads and we will serve. Who are we? We are the servants of Jesus. Verse 5. There should be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Now it's kind of hard for us to understand that there will be no night. But what is the night for? Why do we have night here? For rest. Well, are we going to need to rest? No. You know why? Number one, we're going to have the, the perfected body. Number two, we find our rest in Jesus. So we won't need night time. We won't need the night time for our bodies to rejuvenate, for our mind to settle down and recover and, and heal itself. But we won't need that because we will find our rest in Jesus. And being by Jesus, and I, and I truly believe we as the church will be able to say, I want to be next to Jesus. Boom, we'll be right next to Jesus. Hey, I want to go to Hawaii. Boom, we'll be right next, right in Hawaii. Uh, that's going to be awesome. I may spend a lot of time in Hawaii for a while. But, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just going to be awesome to be able to do the things that we'll be able to do to serve Him. And everything we do is going to be to serve Him. Okay? Verse 6. And He said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the Holy Prophets sent His angel to show unto His servants the things which must shortly be done. Now, this is the angel talking to John right here. All right? He's, he's, uh, he's telling John, Remember, these things are faithful and true. But it's Jesus that says right here in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now, the problem is, how long has it been since this book has been written? Since the first century, right? Since about 90 AD. Right? So we've had, what, let's just easy numbers, 2,000 years since it's been written. Not quite 2,000, 1,900 years. This is, thanks for fixing my math there. Okay. Uh, 1900 years for since uh, uh, this book was written. So does that Lord come quickly? I mean, that, that ain't quite quickly, is it? It is in his time. In his time. Right. What did Peter say? The day is like a thousand years. The day, the day into the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day into the Lord. So think about it. It's God's, Jesus has been in heaven for 1900 years. It's only been like a day and a half, almost two days to him. If you think of it in, in time wise. But the thing is, time doesn't affect God. Time is out, God is outside of time. 
But this word quickly is not like we think quickly. This word quickly is sudden. It's, it's suddenly the Lord is going to come. It, it's not going to be like, wait a minute, do y'all hear that? Wait a minute, that sounds like, is that the trumpets of heaven? Do y'all hear that? All right, everybody get ready. I think Jesus is coming. Oh, look at the clouds. They're, 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 they're gathering together. Oh, no, they're splitting apart. Oh, no, Jesus is coming. Y'all better get ready. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be all of a sudden with the snap of a finger, with a twinkling of an eye. How fast, how quickly is the twinkling of an eye? You know, okay. I can't remember what it's called. Well, it's it's the, the speed of light, whatever the speed of light is. That's the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast Jesus is going to come and return. It, it's not quickly as in time frame. It's suddenly, oh my goodness, we're gone. Quicker than that. So, I mean, you could be standing beside somebody that is unsaved. They're going to turn to you and talk. They're going to turn away, talk to somebody else. And by the time they turn back, you're going to be gone. Okay? That's what that word quickly is for. Behold, I come quickly, or behold, I come suddenly. Blessed is he that keepeth those sayings of this prophecy, of the prophecy of this book. What is the prophecy of this book? Well, if you take just the book of Revelation, what is the prophecy? That Jesus wins in the end. <laughs> Jesus is going to come back. What he, what he says, you believe. I, I mean, we don't have to walk around and say, the earth is doomed, you're going to die and go to hell. You don't, we don't have to do that. We just have to say, hey, look, guess what? Jesus is coming soon. Jesus will come. Uh, Jesus made a promise. God made a promise he would send a Messiah. He came. God made a promise that He will come back and take us home. And He will. All the promises of the Bible have been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. There's not one promise of the Old Testament that will not, that has not been fulfilled or will not be fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, either through the first coming or the second coming. Okay? So we, we can, we can uh, realize and know that what, they, what He says there in verse 6, these things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants of things which must shortly be done. John is also the angel that has been sent to write down these, these uh, uh, faithful and true sayings for us. If it wasn't for John being obedient writing this down, we would know about this. Maybe God would use somebody else. Maybe not. But because John was faithful, because he was a faithful uh, uh, messenger or angel of the Lord, all right. uh, verse 8, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. John's putting himself in here. He said, look, you all know me. Now remember, he's writing this letter to the seven churches. The churches that he's been a part of. Churches that he has preached at. Churches that he has taught. Churches that he knows these people. Okay, There's a lot of churches here, a lot of people. He's, he's known as John the Elder. He's kind of like the grandpa of the church. A lot of these people he's led to the Lord or he's taught. Uh, maybe he's taught their Sunday school class or, or, or a Bible study or some sort. He's, he's been in their homes. So these people will trust him. And he says right there, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, he says, guess what I did? I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. He's being honest here. Let me tell you something. When we get to heaven, we're going to be just as overwhelmed as John is right here. And we possibly could do the same thing. Fall down at the feet of angels. Just think about if we saw an actual, true, heavenly, spiritual angel right here, right here, right now. It would probably scare us a little bit, I believe. And then the beauty and the awe and the holiness of it, I believe we would probably do the same thing. We would probably drop to our knees if not fully prostrate on the ground. But then the angel, because he is from God, would say, like he does in verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. A true angel of God will tell you, worship God. Anybody that tells you that you worship God and they are not of God. So many different false prophets. So many different 
cult leaders say, hey, we worship God and the leader of this group. And many times, these cults, the leaders step up and say, well, worship me and I'll tell God that you've worshipped me. And unfortunately, we have many cults right now that are like that. Worship the, worship the person behind the, the, the microphone. Worship the person that, that is giving you the work. No, don't worship me. I am nobody. I fail as much or more than you do. Worship God. Because only He is worthy to be worshipped. Verse 10, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Why does he say, Seal not the prophecies? Remember what the angel told Daniel? Seal these prophecies up until time uh, to come. Okay? And after a certain amount of time, we're able to look back at Daniel and see these prophecies being fulfilled. But at that point in time, it, Daniel sealed them up and, and people didn't understand them. People didn't know. Them. But this right here says, do not seal these prophecies up. Teach them. So many pastors, so many preachers have been afraid to teach the book of Revelation. I don't know why. I love the book of Revelation. I love it. There's so much stuff there in and there's so much for us to learn. I have learned so much just going through it this time. And if we ever get to go through it again, there's going to be so much more that we're going to learn from. Because there's just so much in this. And that's why God doesn't want it to be sealed up. Because He wants us to learn from it. And, and, and He also wants us to know, how many people here have ever gotten a, a brand new book, excited to read it, and you go to the end of the last chapter and read it? You don't? Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing though God wants you to know in the book of Genesis is when man fell but in the book of Revelation is when man get to be in heaven with, with God and worship him and live with God like he was supposed to and you can walk and talk with Jesus in the new Jerusalem like Adam and Eve were supposed to be able to like we were supposed to be able to if man had not fell if we hadn't brought sin into this world but the thing is the awesome thing is we don't have to worry about sin no more. Why? Because sin and death have been thrown into the lake of fire and never to be known or be touched by anymore. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Uh, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You say, Pastor, what in the world is that? How can a person that's in heaven or would Jesus be filthy or holy or unholy? Can't, can't. Okay. What happened was I stopped reading when I shouldn't have. I got excited there. Jumped the gun. All right. We should have read it, verse 10 and 11 together. Okay. Should have read it, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Meaning, once you read this book, once you read the Bible, Genesis through Revelation, or once you read just the book of Revelation, you have to decide because now you've been told. Okay, Beforehand, they weren't sure. The mystery had not been fully revealed to the people. Uh, even the ones in the Old Testament did not understand the church. They did not know the church was around the corner. They did not realize that the church was going to be a part of the promise and the blessings of God. They thought it was only going to be for the, the, uh, the Israelites. But now God is saying, not only is the church, but everyone that chooses Jesus, that chooses to follow the Messiah, that chooses to follow and believe in the prophecies of this book, now you have a choice. Make up your mind. If you want to be filthy, stay filthy. If you want to be unholy, stay unholy. But you can't blame God because you have been told. People say, why would God, why would a holy God send people to hell? Tell me, why would a holy God send people to hell? He doesn't. Right. He doesn't. The people choose. Right. You're right. The people choose. You either choose to serve Jesus and accept His salvation, or you choose not to. And it has to be done while you're alive. This, this stuff of purgatory and maybe get prayed out and paid out or whatever is a bunch of baloney. It's false. You make your choice before you die. 
And everybody will be judged by the amount of knowledge they have of the Savior. So that, it, that covers even the, the indigenous people that are in Africa or in, in, in uh, 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 wherever. <laughs> and those that, that may have never heard the gospel, but they have a knowledge of a God. And we will just have to leave God up and His holiness of knowing how to judge them on their righteousness or the lack of on their knowledge of salvation or the lack of. It's not up to us. But people choose whether to search for Jesus or not. People choose, especially those that have been taught. And, and, and I dare say there's a person in the United States that hasn't at least heard about Jesus. They may not have been told the full gospel. Excuse me. They may not have been told all that we have been learning here in the last few months here in the book of Revelation. But they have an opportunity. You know, you can go to the uh, Dollar General and get a Bible for a dollar. I mean, you, you can get a Bible anywhere. You go to the Gideon and say, hey, I would like a Bible. They'll give it to you. Hey, come here. Uh, ask me. I'll give you one. If you really truly want a Bible, I'll give you one. So I, I am searching. I want, and, and there's no excuse. So that's the reason he says, he that is filthy, let him be filthy. He that is righteous, let him be righteous. Make a choice. You have to make a choice now. Okay? Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Who is this? Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He says, and behold, I come quickly. There he is. He said again, be prepared, be ready, make a choice because I'm coming quickly. Suddenly, I'm going to be here and the choice will be made. Suddenly, death comes. There's a lot of people that don't get to, to plan their death. There's a lot of people that don't get that prolonged uh, uh, time of, well, you know, the doctors are giving me six months and so we know it's probably three to four months, and I'm, it, a lot of people just all of a sudden are dead. A lot of people are just all of a sudden gone. So you have to be prepared. This, this behold I come quickly is behold I come suddenly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Works saves? Yeah. Your work saves? No. Okay. What is that? What does that mean that, that he, he's going to reward every man according to his works? According to as his work shall be. What you do and live your life for Jesus is how you're going to be rewarded. Remember I told you about how white and how bright your robes will be? It's going to be according to how clean you are, how, how you wash your robes. Well, washing your robes is living for Christ. Uh, washing your robes, how bright in the rewards that you will receive is how much you've done in the name of Jesus for Jesus, not for your glory. Because a lot of times we do stuff for Jesus, but we get that pat on the back. We get rewarded. So, but those things that you do for Jesus, those, those times, let's just say you, you meet somebody and the Lord says, just walk up to them and give them $10. They, they need $10. You do it, you say, hey, look, the Lord told me to give you $10, you walk away, done. Nobody said thank you, nobody did nothing, but you, you were obedient to the Lord. You walked up to somebody, and they got to talk to you and say, hey, let me pray for you. They look at you real funny. Hey, the Lord wants me to pray with you. Let me pray with you right now. They don't, you know, they might say thank you, but you don't get a, a, a big pat on the back. A big, that is a reward. The Lord's, the, the, back up here. The Lord is going to reward you because you did it for Him but not for you. Because you were obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And not because, well, well I'm going to pray for this guy. These people over here are going to see me. They're going to see how, how goody-goody I am. No, you just got your reward. And it ain't, it ain't worth nothing. It's worth uh, the, like the hay stubble. It's going to get burned up. Okay? Verse 14. And blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city, for without are dogs and sorcerers and warmongers and murderers and adulterers and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Does that mean that outside of this new Jerusalem there's going to be these dogs, these whoremongers, uh, 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 sorcerers and murderers and adulterers and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie? 
Is that, is that what that means? That outside of this new Jerusalem, we're still going to have this going on? No. What he's saying there is, right there in verse 14, he makes it clear, blessed are they that do that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life. Who is going to have right to the tree of life? Everybody that lives on the earth and in the new Jerusalem. But to be able to live on the earth and the new Jerusalem during this time, you must have already had to have been saved. You had to have made the choice of salvation, of accepting a salvation, whether it be before the rapture or during the uh, tribulation period or during even during the millennial reign. Do you realize there will be people that will reject Christ even during the millennial reign? He'll be here on the earth and they will still reject Him. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you, they'll be able to see Him face to face. There will be cameras all over Him. The whole world will be... I mean, Jesus will be in Jerusalem and we'll be able to open up our phones. Woo! There's Jesus. Look at that. How beautiful He is. It's going to be awesome. People will still reject. Will still turn away from him. They've done it before. They've done it before, and will still will. And, and, and but there will be people that will choose Jesus. There will be people that it will will accept his salvation. And those are the people that will walk on the earth. So what he's making clear is is that blessed are those that are going to be here on the earth with Jesus. Verse sixteen. And I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Why does he say he's the root of the offspring of David? What is the promise that God made to David? Jesus will conquer him. Well, yes, that's the, the, the ending. But God made a promise to David that he would always have uh, uh, lineage on the throne. That he would always have a uh, um, lineage. That's not the right word. I can't think of the word. But it, it, uh, if you think about it in, uh, in the uh, lineage of Jesus, uh, both on with on Mary's side and on Joseph's side, it was a lineage and it went all the way back to King David. God made a promise that David's offspring, David's offspring, he would always have a, uh, uh, an offspring on the throne. Well, that's a fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that God made to David, and he is the bright and morning star. What is the bright and morning star? Right before daybreak, there's always a star that is just bright as can be before the sun breaks before we see. Now we uh, we call it maybe the North Star, uh, and sometimes it's it's other stars. But Jesus is the promise and our hope of tomorrow. That promise of the bright morning star is the promise of the sun will shine again. The sun will come up. The sun will. Give us warmth for the day. But our hope is in Jesus. That tomorrow is going to be so much better. Today may have been tough on us because we're still touched by sin and life, but tomorrow is going to be so much better. Our hope is in Jesus. Our promise is in Jesus. Verse 17, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, Come and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Right here, the Spirit and the Bride say come. This is what we as a church are supposed to do. Bring people to Jesus. Telling people that Jesus is coming soon. Telling people they need salvation. Telling people you don't have to do anything. Just accept it. Take of the water of life free. That's all we have to do. That's our command. I mean, that's what Jesus said, wasn't it? To go out into the world, teaching and preaching the gospel. And it says right here, verse 17, and the Spirit and the bride say come. That's God's Spirit 
leading people, telling people, come, know Jesus. Come, accept his salvation. Come to the Lord. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. <laughs> That's a heck of a warning, isn't it? I mean, it says right there in verse 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's a promise. God says, you change my word and you're going to be punished. What are the plagues of this book? What, what do the plagues of this book end up being? Death. What is death? Eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from God. So you, you change the words of this book to glorify you, to make you look better, to take away from God, which is what you're doing. Now, I'm not saying different translations. I'm not saying from King James to the English Standard to the New Living to the NIV. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you change this and put your name in there. You change this to, 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 for you to manipulate people. God's going to give you the plagues of this book. And the plagues of this book is death. That's what plagues do. That's what a plague is. It brings death. So God's going to take the person's life that takes away or adds to this for what God has said. Verse 20. He which testified these things say, surely I come quickly. Amen. Jesus saying it again. Get ready. I'm coming quickly. Get ready. Be ready. Even us, those of us that are Christians, we need to be ready. We don't need to get caught with our pants down. We don't need to be caught with uh, uh, in a bad situation and you say, oh, Lord, sorry, I didn't know you was coming yet. I, I, I had other things going on. We've got to be prepared. We've got to be ready. Because he's, he's going to come before we know it. Verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. The unmerited love. The unmerited, unearned love of God. His grace. What is grace? The one thing that you don't deserve, God gives you. It's His love. His grace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Unfortunately, we are done with the book of Revelation. Yes? Can I read a poem that I just found in my Bible? Yes. Kind of goes with this. Can y'all hear me? You want the microphone? I'm going to kind of put this down. Over there you go. It says, There is a time we know not when, a place we know not where, which marks the destiny of, of men to glory or despair. There is a line by us unseen which crosses every path, which marks the boundary between God's mercy and His wrath. To pass that limit is to die. To die is to be is to die as if by stealth. It does not dim the beaming eye, nor pale the glow of health. The conscious may be still at ease, the spirit light and gay, and that which pleases still may please, and can and care be thrust away. But on the fo that forehead God has set indelibly a mark, unseen by man, for man as yet is blind and in the dark. He feels purchased, he feels perchance that all is well, and every fear is calm. He lives, he dies, he walks in hell, not only doomed but damned. Oh, where is that mysterious line that may be my, that may by men be crossed? beyond which God himself has sworn that he who goes is lost. An answer from the sky repeat, skies repeats, Ye who from God depart today, O oh, hear his voice, today repent and harden not your heart. I thought that kind of went along with Revelation. Mm -hmm. Especially right here. Yeah. 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 Repent today. Because you never know when that line's going to, you're going to cross that line. Yeah. Okay.
Any questions? Any anything y'all want to ask? Oh, uh, you got time for a recap? Because I missed all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hold on. A couple of Sundays, a couple of Wednesdays. No, hold on to your pants here. Let's go. Back. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, that is it. Yeah, we missed a few recordings, but yeah, yeah. Fortunately, that is why I recorded. And if and if you guys go to the Facebook page and it's not on there, uh, if, if you go to my YouTube page, it'll be there. And, and let me know if I haven't put it on the Facebook page because I'll make sure I did you know, on there for some some people don't know it's on YouTube. So. Got a lady that uh, I went to school with her daughter and she's watched every one of them. And uh, her daughter's messaged me on Facebook. She said, "We're missing one. Did you did you post it yet?" And I said, "No, I forgot to record it. I'm sorry. Mama's gonna be so mad." <laughs> You know, uh, back what, just a few pages uh, before, then I talk about the uh, the ones that gave up their heads. Pretty much, it was the ones that 